Hi. Hello there. Welcome to Smart Aspirations with Justin Huff. Sit back, chill out, and go on a journey around the world. Around the world. Justin will discuss tales of hope, discovery, and general irreverence with some of the most dynamic personalities in the travel business. Remember, we do cool shit, and so can you. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of Smart Aspirations with Justin Huff. Did I just say episode 10? We're in double digits now. That's crazy. So I want to thank all of you for tuning in each week and spreading the word. It means so much to both myself and the guests and everything that they're talking about. Today, I'm super stoked to have Wendy Pineno come on the show. Wendy is the pangolin researcher at Swalu Kalahari in South Africa's Northern Cape province. What makes this interview so much fun is that we're talking about cute little animals. There's no politics. There's no COVID. There aren't any wildfires, which we're sitting in the middle of in California right now. Uh, no one's talking about masks or distance learning or riots. So this podcast is filled with nothing but cuteness and an escape for you. Uh, there's a, a bit of a sound glitch at around minute 27, 28. So we've tried to edit out uh, a little bit of the dead space in there. So just bear with us a second or two. Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, two things I did want to mention before we head into the chat. Wendy talks about her project KEEP, which stands, it's an acronym for the Kalahari Endangered Ecosystem Project, uh, which is doing a ton for conservation in this part of South Africa. And I've included the link to their Facebook page onto the video and in the description, as well as an email address if you want to contact them to learn more about what they're doing there and how you can help donate if you so feel inclined. Uh, just a reminder to check out check out Wendy's enthusiasm when when she talks about seeing a pangolin in the wild for the first time. And if you haven't been on a safari before or a specific wildlife trip to any other part of the world, like Antarctica or India, Sri Lanka, uh, seeing snow leopards in um, in northern India or or Nepal, uh, it's the biggest adrenaline pumping experience on the planet, in, in my humble opinion. Uh, you can't plan it. It comes to you. Everything's unique. And I, I get more of a rush seat having these experiences like, uh, you know, seeing a mountain gorilla for the first time or, or a tiger or, or a, a Kalahari black mane lion, for example. It's completely on stage and it's so humbling to be in that environment and, and having that moment with, with the wildlife. And it, it's bigger than skydiving or whitewater rafting or, uh, zip lining again, that's my opinion, but it just keeps happening and it's, it's addicting. I got to admit. So get out there as soon as you can. Once this COVID stuff is over, there are a few destinations in South Africa open at the moment. South Africa does remain closed. Uh, but the team is on site at Swalu, uh, doing everything that they can for, uh, for the reserve itself and to preserve the wildlife. And so, um, from what I understand, that's going really, really well and they haven't been affected, but, um, so if you want to get a heads up on planning your safari, uh, please click the contact details below. It's also in the show description. Um, uh, please subscribe to the video. Give us a like if you, if you enjoy what you hear. Um, uh, thank you so much again for spreading the word about Smart Aspirations. Our guests are, and, and both myself, are, are super thankful for everything that you guys have done so far. Um, with, so with that said, I will hand it over to Wendy and myself. We hope you enjoy. Again, cute baby penguins. Take care. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining Smart Aspirations today with Justin Huff. I'm your host, Justin Huff, and I'm honored to be joined by Wendy Pineno. Wendy is the lead pangolin research at Swallow in South Africa, as well as the head of the Kalahari Endangered Ecosystem Project, also known as KEEP. Wendy is um, also a PhD student. I believe you're finishing up um, your dissertation. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Awesome, awesome. Well, you are a braver soul than I am, and especially <laughs> <laughs> especially with the cool evenings from Johannesburg, I just want to thank you so much for, for working late and coming on. Wendy, how have you been? Good, very good. It's uh, very chilly here in Joburg. I'm not in the field at the moment, so i um, doing lockdown in Joburg with the family for now. But yeah, all things are going well, just wrapping up this PhD, hopefully awesome. so sooner rather than later. 
yes, yeah, sooner rather than later. And now couldn't be a more perfect time to do a little extra research and work. And thankfully you're with exactly. family. That's, that's awesome. Exactly. No, it's good. It's been good to just sit down and focus and get this thing done. For sure. For sure. And, and just going a bit into your background. Um, when, when I first started selling safaris, years ago and I, I would normally get this like massive like deer in the headlights or people would look at me like I have three heads like when I told people outside of the safari business about pangolins and how like oh oh you've been to Africa cool what's like the coolest thing you'd want to see on a safari and I'd say pangolin and people would be like what and and now that pangolins have <laughs> have recently been, people have been paying a lot more attention to endangered wildlife mm -hmm. in the mainstream media. Uh, I'm getting less of that reaction. People, are, even, even my father, when I told him what I was doing um, today, he was like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know what you're talking about. Really? It, sure enough, he does. How would you describe a pangolin to somebody who has absolutely no clue what a pangolin is? Oh, it's, you know, Justin, it really is a difficult thing to describe to someone. It is, it is something that you have to see, but in simple terms, it's a scaly anteater. So yeah. something you would compare to maybe an armadillo, for example, looks pretty much the same. So that's what I would describe it as for sure. Awesome. It, it's, we'll, we'll put pictures and everything up on the podcast. And they're, they're one of the Perfect. cutest, most incredible little, little creatures I've ever seen in my life. And um, again, back to, back to your background, there's this huge public misconception um, that, that people in, in wildlife conservation have this driven mission. Uh, like this is what they're always going to do. Uh, they knew it at a really, really young age. And that, that, from what I understand, when we first had our chat, that, that wasn't you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey into what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. Um, certainly it wasn't, wasn't something I'd seen myself doing 20 years ago. Hell, even six years ago, I had no idea this is what I was going to end up doing. So um, growing up, you know, it was one of those things where I knew what I didn't want to do. I knew I didn't want to sit in an office nine to five. You know, I knew that was not in my mind. That was not going to happen. And I would do anything in my power to stay away from that. And I always had an affinity to wildlife, but I never even knew that research and conservation was an area of work that you could go into. You know, I had no concept of that. I didn't grow up with someone teaching me that, you know, in school, they never told me that research was an option, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, always, you know, was outdoors as a child and always playing with insects and, you know, bringing <laughs> insects home in a lunchbox, driving parents crazy, <laughs> um, doing those kinds of things. But then um, when I went to university, I applied for a few things, not knowing really what I wanted to do. But um, I ended up getting into a biological sciences program uh, for, three uh, for three years. And in the second year, I had to choose majors. And it was like, you know, I could do human physiology, I could do human anatomy, I could do zoology. And I thought, goodness, you know, what do I do? I, I have to choose because this is going to be my life's career. And so I spoke to a couple of people and they said a really good combination is the physiology and zoology. And so I ended up double majoring like that. Smart. And I think that really set the way for where I was going. I didn't know it at the time, but it was really good advice because it was a really good combination. And then um, we do, so we do a three year degree and then a fourth year, which is an honors year, which is the first time you really do a research project um, by yourself with okay. a supervisor. And then I was like, this is amazing. I get to work <laughs> with animals. I, I can do this, you know, and I get to write about it afterwards. And then after that, I kind of went to my supervisor at the time, at the end of the year, and I said, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know, like, what am I supposed to do after this? Um, I didn't think the project I was doing at the time was going anywhere. And, she was like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's a project on pangolins. It's pretty much yours if you want to, you know, think about it. And I was just like, pangolins? Of course, <laughs> of course I'll do this, you know. So I jumped on board and then blinked. And five years later, here I am sitting, you are. chatting to you, you know. Just five years ago. It's incredible how time flies. I know. I know. Well, it seems like, like I said, I blinked and then it was, yeah, now I'm here. But it's been just the most insane journey and you know, there was supposed to be another student doing this project and she had given it up to work with larger mammals. Ah, I'm just okay. thinking my path could have been totally different right now. I could have been, who knows what I could, I could have been working with giraffes or elephants or something <laughs> else, you know, anything really. But I did know always that outdoors was where I wanted to be. So that's great. That was always deep set inside me. You know? And when you were saying you were always outdoors at a young age and growing up, did you grow up in Johannesburg? 
grew up in Johannesburg, but my family was very um, supportive of us being outdoors as kids, my brother and myself. Um, and we went camping Perfect. a lot. So we were outdoors and stuff, you know, we, d- we didn't spend much time in game reserves. And so I never really had too much exposure to that, but just being outside really mm-hmm. helped and them encouraging me to play in the dirt, pick up insects <laughs> if I wanted to, you know, it was never like, don't touch that. Right. Like, Do what you want, you know? So yeah, I really appreciate that kind of support growing up. And I think it really paved the way for where I am now. And how would you describe, you know, being outdoors and uh, Swalu, where you're, where you work in the field is incredibly different than other environments in South Africa. How would you describe the general ecosystem of the, in that part of the Kalahari to people? So I think a lot of people have this misconception that Kalahari is desert. It's mm-hmm. completely dry and it's just yeah. these beautiful red sands and rolling dunes. And while we do have that, our dunes, for example, are really vegetated. Um, so we, we call it the green Kalahari. And that really just means we get a bit more rainfall than the general Kalahari. So it's a lot more lush than people realize. Um, okay. But compared to what I've been used to for my entire life, it's very <laughs> different. It's very, very dry. We get a good amount of rain, but not as much rain as Johannesburg would or the eastern side of the country would. You know, I'm very used to that low felt environment. Sure. Very different vegetation. But I tell you what, that Kalahari environment captures you. And day one that I stepped foot on that reserve, I was, that was it. You were I knew hooked. this was going to be home for the next few days, next few days, next few years. For sure. <laughs> well, which is, is fascinating because it's, it's former farmland converted into this game reserve with all these incredible exactly. projects that are going on. And, and if speaking, speaking of environments and projects, and I know that you're really involved with climate change. And I wanted to ask, um, what have you seen in specifically in South Africa as it relates to climate change and, and how can, um, yeah, let, let's just back it up. What have you seen personally throughout your throughout your experience? Yeah, it's it's a challenging thing because climate change doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen over a sure. week and certainly not even a few years. You know, it, it is a long-term thing and I'm still young, so I haven't experienced, <laughs> experienced too much of it. But being in Joburg, what I have noticed is the temperatures are going up. You know, you experience a lot warmer summers, for example. Um, but not only that, you've got a lot more extreme events so around the country, a lot more drought events um, yes. and unpredictable rainfall. I think that's a key one as well. Rainfall is not happening at the same time it used to. Mm-hmm. And so if you're a farmer, for example, and you're trying to manage a property and you're depending on rainfall to arrive at a certain time and it doesn't, that has such cascading effects. It's, it's quite scary. Actually. It's disastrous for your entire season. Exactly. Exactly. And in terms of Swalu, just in the past five years that I've been there, um, again, too short a time span to to be able to make any conclusions about the work that we've been doing but certainly every year has been very different in terms Mm -hmm. of when the rainfall arrives how much rainfall arrives um so we had some really really dry years and we've seen the effects on pangolins for example and a number of other species and how that effect cascades throughout the system Mm -hmm. and that's where keep comes in you know we're really looking at those cascading effects but we'll chat a bit more about that i assume in in a few (laughs) minutes for sure Definitely, we will. Mm-hmm. It, this year, if I'm not mistaken, well, I, I've seen it on friends and the safari businesses and uh, socials and everything, and we've had a good year of rain. Is um, and have you seen any? Well, I know that you're not in the field right now, but when will mm-hmm. you start to see the effects of having a good rainy season come into play? The thing about the Kalahari is it it shows it quite quickly when you've had rain. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the plants and stuff in the system are so adapted to taking advantage of any water that comes. So when it does rain, these plants sprout, the flowers come about. It's just like, it's, it's like give it a week or two and you are seeing beautiful flowers and everything. And so that really comes into play. Seemingly You just overnight. take a little drive. Exactly. It seems like you blink and then <laughs> all of a sudden everything's green and it's really beautiful. But, um, you know, we, we all say we've had a good amount of rain this year, but it's still not great. Mm-hmm. It's still, it's probably sitting around the average or probably even a little bit below average. Um, but certainly not as much as I assume the farmers around that area would want. Mm-hmm. And how does the the rainy season affect pangolin behavior? And are they easier to find in the dry season or in the rainy season? Also, quite a tricky question. Um, what we are seeing and what they were seeing with the, the art fox as well, because um, Swalu hosted a, re- a research project on art fox through our research group. Okay. Um, before me and what they saw with the art fox was that in particularly dry years, and this happens with pangolins as well, pangolins are coming out earlier during the winter 
same as aardvarks. And so mm-hmm. in terms of seeing them more easily, you might see them during the day, during winter. So they are predominantly nocturnal. And so not a lot of people are driving around at night and their eyes don't necessarily re- reflect like a lot of other animals do. And so it's difficult to find them in, in the summer oh, okay. when they are out at night. But then during the winter, they seem to come out um, during the day. But when we've had really good rainfall, it seems like they don't need to do that dur- mm-hmm. during the day in winter. So they can stay nocturnal during winter if they've had a really good rainfall season. And so that's just a behavioral aspect that we're seeing. But the real issue is that rainfall has such big effects on their prey, which is ants and termites. Ants and termites depend on grasses. If there's no rain, there's no grass, there's no, there's grass, no ants yeah. and termites. And then all of your anteaters are going to suffer from that. Yeah. And so, you know, keep talking about these cascading effects. One element it's all changes connected. the game. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, exactly. look where we are right now as a global society. One little tiny exactly. thing happens and then the <laughs> entire planet comes to a halt. So. Mad, mad. Oh, my goodness. Um, now, with with all this behavior and different rain patterns and people wanting to go to Swalu, not just for to to experience the unique wildlife there, what more or less? I, I, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Uh, you don't have to answer this with certainty at all if you don't want to. Is there a percentage chance of a guest coming to Swalu and seeing a pangolin? We could never guarantee a sighting. Of course, with of anything course. in wildlife, yeah, you yeah, could yeah, never guarantee that. Um, if you did go to Swalu and you wanted to get involved with the research side of things, if you wanted to see a pangolin and chat to a pangolin researcher, mm-hmm. um, you, you have an okay chance if your researcher is out with an animal at that time, mm-hmm. you know, the guide at the time could call up the, re- the researcher and say, you know, I've got some guests who are really interested in the research. Could they come and join you? Then absolutely. If I have a pangolin with me at that time, you almost have a hundred percent chance of seeing it. <laughs> but of course, you know, and then that one would be one with a tracking transmitter on it because I have to keep tabs on specific individuals. Oh, okay. And so okay. it certainly gives us a better chance of finding him, but certainly <laughs> not, not ever guaranteed. I've spent several nights going out and just not finding one, even with a tracking transmitter. So we would it's never guarantee it. But for exactly, sure. but it's a it's a good place to start if you were looking for pangolin. Okay, perfect. I mean, and I also think that it's for people that haven't been on safari before. It's such a really nice compliment to something like, especially scenically and wildlife wise, uh, in comparison to like Asabi sands and the the lower bush. Exactly, sure. exactly. Very, mind. very different experience. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and the Kalahari really offers these unique species on top of the different vegetation and the environment. You know, it's it's a special right. place. Very complimentary. Yeah. And I think the conservation story is just completely magical too, about exactly. how the land was completely changed. Um, yeah. Now, uh, to keep, again, for people, uh, we'll include the links and everything, we'll include charts. It, KEEP stands for Kalahari Endangered Ecosystem Projects. I know it's new. Could you tell me a little bit about its history, how it came about, and where you expect it to go? Yeah, sure. We. Um, when I say we, I mean the group that we're associated with now in this project, but more specifically, my supervisor and um, another guy, so Andrea Fuller and Graham Alexander. Uh, Andrea works mostly with physiology of large mammals um, in response to climate change, and Graham Alexander does a lot of reptile work. Okay. And they had already had projects established at Swalu, and they were kind of sitting around the fire, and everyone's thinking, you know, we're all doing our individual projects, but kind of looking at the same thing. We're all, all trying to figure out what's, what's going to happen with climate change. What's it going to do to our respective species? Mm-hmm. And they kind of said to themselves, well, why don't we do it as one big, almost umbrella project, you know, yeah. measure the same parameters, get the same answers collectively and at the same time. And at the end of the day, we'll be able to tell this amazing story about how climate change is not only affecting one species, but several species in the system. And so at that time, my supervisor, she came to me um, and she said, well, would you be interested in being a project manager on this? And I was thinking, of, of course, this is amazing. Like, this is mad. You know, so I jumped on board. And since then, we, our first kind of group meeting, we would identify key species within a basic food web. So what species would have an effect on the next species? For example, okay, we would like to look at birds. What, what plays a role around birds? So snakes feed on birds, for example. Mm-hmm. Birds feed on insects or caterpillars, whatever they're feeding on, lizards even. And so we needed to find key people that specialize in those species or those areas. Um, for example, if we're looking for someone to measure vegetation over time, we need to go and find someone who specializes in trees and grasses, you know. And luckily at the time, 
there was already a long-term project on birds. It was already a long-term project on snakes. And so we just started pulling these elements together and then started identifying the little links in our system to go and find experts that can deal with those little um, critters that we're missing in our system. Dung beetles, for example, who knew how important their role so would be in our little food web. Exactly. And so we found a guy, uh, Marcus Byrne, who does has done a lot of amazing work on dung beetles. And so he came along and joined on board. And so we kind of, yeah, we, we started that. Um, it's, it's still, like you said, in the beginning stages, and we're, we're still trying to launch it properly, you know, to get all of the elements in our food web. But we're, we're almost there. We've got a lot of um, different species going. And we can already bounce off of historical data collection from those projects that have been going for years, including the pangolins and the art hogs, whatever else. And then in terms of going forward, yeah, we, we, at the end of the day, we want to be able to say climate change is having an effect, an effect on species, mm -hmm. or not just species, but a system, the Kalahari system. Um, and that certainly won't happen in a year's time, two years' time. We're thinking 10, 15, 10, hopefully 15. even 20 years, you know. And even that is a tiny, tiny portion of this huge time scale that we're thinking because climate change really is this long-term process. But we'll start to see these little trends along the way. And, and we're not coming in and saying we're only going to do something at the end of that 15, 20 years. We want to be able to have these outputs as we go along. Mm -hmm. So each year we want to say, okay, we want to publish on this and we can publish things on natural history of different species, on their ecology, whatever, along the way, you know, but at the end of the day, we want to bring all of that together and say, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. And I think that looking back on it, you'll just kind of pinch yourself to see like all the difference that's been made. And uh, I wanted to, and you were so nice to get me some, some costs and th these projects I want the audience to understand that there's, it's not just something that's thrown together and people do on their own free time. This stuff costs money and does rely a lot on donations. And, and just to give people a figure for, these are little elements of an annual cost. Travel costs, you know, getting, out, getting your researchers out there, um, roughly per annum, and I've, I've converted this from South African Rand to US dollars, 11,500. Um, the, the running and research cost, which is the, the cost of animal capture, surgery, sampling, um, lab consumables, 14,500. Um, data logging, uh, data loggers for microclimate, animal temperature measurement, $10,500. Tracking transmitters and receivers and activity for GPS tagging, uh, $13,000, thir roughly 13,300 bucks a year. Um, and then your equipment cost, which is roughly can run you around ten thousand bucks for a total of around sixty thousand dollars per year, and over five years, that's three hundred thousand dollars, and that's basically it. That's that's at the the current exchange rate with the South African rand, and that's significant. Um, and I think the more that, that we're going to share the links to socials and everything and how clients can donate. And I know it's still kind of at its infancy, but I think it's super important for people to understand, um, you know, how much this stuff costs, the cost of conservation, yeah. um, you know, what, and, and this isn't something that a, a stay, stay, I guess staying at Swalu might not even know about, uh, but it, it's definitely something to shed light on and to bring awareness to. Uh, do you anticipate these costs raising or as the years go by, or is this more or less something that's kind of fixed in your mindset? Yeah. I mean, a budget like that, that we put together, it's, it's what we anticipate spending and that's something we can put forward to potential funders to give them an idea of the kind of money we're looking for. But mm -hmm. you know, along the way, anything can go wrong. Your equipment can break and fail and you need to repurchase. Um, we're working with wildlife. Mm -hmm. You might have an entire team coming out ready to collar some animals for a week and you spend so much money doing that and you haven't found a single animal and they have right. to go back to Joburg or wherever they came from and then try again the next time. So um, certainly in that respect, costs can change all the time and they can fluctuate, but you know, then there's inflation rates and there's all kinds of issues, economical issues. So yeah, costs can de definitely fluctuate, but yeah, I don't, I don't see it increasing too much over the short term, mm -hmm. but who knows? <laughs> we'll have to see where it goes. And we, you know, at, scientists have to be very resilient and kind of adjust and adaptable and deal with the, the conditions that come their way. And of course yeah, you got to make do. Of course. Um, I, here's a question. How would you, how do you see that source funding coming from? Do you see that coming from Tswalu guests? Do you see that coming from 
outside investors, any comments? I mean, we're, we're always welcome to whatever comes our way. You know, we would never turn <laughs> away funding, of course. Um, but a combination of parties have already funded the project and it's what we like to do. We like to collaborate mm -hmm. um, within this project. And so at the moment, for example, we've got Suzuki sponsoring two vehicles for us. Yes. So that's yes. Co covered by that. And then the Swalu Foundation, which is the foundation that hosts the research at Swalu, they, um, they're direct collaborators in the project as well. And so they might, um, I don't know, donate some tracking transmitters or whatever, you know, we, we would apply okay. to them to say, okay, we need money for this and this and this. And that most of that money comes directly from guest donations. So when a guest comes to stay at Su ah, Swalu okay. and they want to donate to the Swalu Foundation, then we have access to that money if we want it, if we apply for it. Brilliant. And, and we'll, we'll include links and email addresses yeah. for the, for the listeners to donate should they see fit. And yeah. um, I wanted to briefly touch on the, uh, uh, on the illegal wildlife market. I know it's not the most pleasant topic and this is an optimistic podcast, but we do live in the age of spin and there's a lot of yep. conflicting information <laughs> that's out there. Um, fr from, from your perspective, have you seen um, poaching in South Africa and where is it going? How does, how does it work um, from your experience specifically? I don't want to get into the whole, the whole issue. Yeah, of course it is a tricky one because I I'm, predominantly focusing on ecology and physiology of pangolins. So I don't really dabble in with the whole illegal wildlife trade, but, but of course, having worked with pangolins for so long, you know, I get consulted with certain things um, in terms of if a pangolin was confiscated from the trade, okay, what do we do? Where do what are we like, what is the procedure here? You know, where do we go with this? Um, and I haven't been too directly involved in the whole pr process, but I've, I've kind of indirectly been involved with the whole rehabilitation program, um, or the process, and then putting them back out into the wild. But I haven't myself seen any poaching, but I've heard some close friends of mine, you know, I could get a phone call from someone saying, I've just heard on the streets that someone's trying to sell a pangolin. What am I supposed to do? And all I can really do is say, here's a phone number. You should get in touch with someone who's, you know, more directly in the police or wherever it is. But um, it's it's scary. And it's certainly, I'm, I'm hearing of more cases than I did five years ago. Mm. Um, it's definitely escalating. Um, and we can never tell if it's just more public awareness. People now know that this is a thing that's happening. Our police, for example, um, are they doing more roadblocks specifically looking for pangolin or are they just coming across more pangolin because it's of more poaching? You know, mm -hmm. um, Are our police more educated about this now? So yeah, it's, it's a big chain and it's not just South Africa, it's Africa, it's Asia. It's a huge network sure. as with any other wildlife trade, but yeah, it's certainly not helping that pangolins are facing so many threats and now, you know, poaching and climate change and electric fences and habitat loss. It's just like an endless thing. And so really, if we don't get a grip on this poaching thing, it's, it's a scary future. Now I'm going to ask an ignorant question is, is, Swalu and the Kalahari, is that the only area in South Africa where you can find pangolin? No, so so pangolins span kind of the northern parts of South Africa, all the way from the west to the east. Okay. Um, so you could see pangolins in Sabi, for example. You okay. probably don't have the highest chances. Anywhere where you have harder ground or tougher soils or leaf litter, it's going to be difficult to track them. But, you know, you can go to the eastern side of the country and see pangolins as well. Okay. Yeah. I was just trying, trying to think logistically how it would work from you know, the poaching perspective and getting them out mm -hmm. and, and everything. It's just a completely wild, bizarro kind of wild South, if you will. Um, yeah. Mindset, but um, back to, back to something a bit more positive. Um, baby <laughs> pangolins. Let's talk people love oh. myself included love baby, of course. cute baby animals. And when a mother pangolin is pregnant, and she gives birth, how many babies do they usually have? Just one at a time. And it's okay. called a pup. A pup? Yeah. A pup. That is adorable. <laughs> that is pretty bizarre. It's crazy. I, I'm gonna but they are to, so cute. I'm going to try to source some photos from you to get some cute of course, yeah, absolutely. photos. Do they have scales when they're little? They do. They're, they're quite soft. Um, I imagine I've never seen a baby penguin being born. Um, I've seen one. The youngest one I've seen is about a week old, but 
they are born with the scales and then they harden overnight. So pretty much like your fingernails, I guess. Oh, wow. You're born okay. as a human baby, you know, born with them, but they're pretty soft and then right. they harden very soon after that. Over time. And, and how, mm. how long does it take for them to reach a full mature adult size? We don't really know, to be honest. Um, it's one of those things, first of all, pangolins are so under-researched that we, we, we don't know much about them as a whole. And now you're dealing with pangolin babies. They're giving birth inside burrows and they're very secretive. So it's difficult to try and find out things about them. But that's kind of one of our missions in the Kalahari now is to work with these babies and find out more. But from what I've seen in the past couple of years, it seems like, so they'll be in the burrow, they'll be born in the burrow and they'll only move out of the burrow when mom's moving to a new burrow. So they'll never go and forage together. So your chances of seeing it is very rare. And so we depend on camera traps. We put them outside the the burrow and that gives us like a really sneak peek into (laughs) these animals' lives. But they'll move out about two and a half to three months. They'll start investigating the outside world by themselves, you know, for an hour at a time. And then anything from four and a half, usually four and a half to six months, but even up to 10 months, they're completely independent. They're away from mom on their own mission. We have no idea at what age they reach sexual maturity when they can Mm. reproduce. We think it's about two years. Okay. Um, But other than that, we don't know too much about that. So tell us (laughs) about pangolin lifespan. Yeah, so it's a bit of a conflicting one. Yeah, under normal circumstances. um, We we don't know how long they would live in the wild. Um, I'm happy to go and spend as many years out in the wild with a pangolin to find out. I'd love to do that. (laughs) But um, supposedly in captivity, they will live until about 20 years. Okay. Um, but this species in particular, I work with the Timmings ground pangolin. So by the way, there's eight species in the world, not just the one. Um, I should just establish that there as well. But yeah, our species doesn't survive very well in captivity. And so I think the record is about four years for that okay. one. But based on how long um, or how slow their life histories are, how slow their metabolism is and only giving birth once a year, um, that indicates that 20 years is quite realistic. Okay. And is it possible if it, for a pangolin, pangolin to that that's been born in captivity, and being re-released into the wild? Is that first of all, is that even possible, or is it too dangerous? And if it is possible, what's the process like? Yeah, it's also a tricky one. Something that's not really been looked into. I think pangolin research has only really escalated in the last decade. Um, not not much is known at all. Um, but there seems to be some good success stories on that kind of thing. Okay. Um, if you if it's done right, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I'm <laughs> not by any means a, an animal rehabber, um, but it would take a lot of time and patience. You would need to take your pangolin for a walk every day, for example, because they don't feed well in captivity. They won't mm-hmm. just eat what you give them. Right. So you would need large open spaces with the suitable prey. Go and let them feed, do what they want to do, You know, take them for walks and then bring them back every day. And then hopefully someday release them into the wild in a safe place. And you would need someone there for a while, keeping track of them to make sure they're doing okay Mm -hmm. um, before you just dump them into the wild. But yeah, it's still, uh, I think we're, we're we're getting there. A lot of research is being invested into that kind of thing, but still I feel a long way away before we can truly say that there's successful release programs like that. Well, right. Like you said, it's still a, a, a primitive field of research, but at the same time, it's completely fascinating. And the contributions Absolutely. that you and your team are going to do are going to be kind of the foundation for the generations going forward on, on what's been going on there. Um, we hope so, yeah. What's the biggest, ch- I mean, uh, take a legal wildlife market out of the equation. What is the biggest challenge for these little guys right now? I, for any species, my first thought would be habitat loss you know we as humans are quite ruthless we want to make our homes anywhere and everywhere um, and we don't really care about what we're destroying in the meantime whether it's an ant's nest or whether it's you know 200,000 hectares for elephants or whatever you're dealing with Um, so certainly you know a lot of animals and if if we come back to climate change a lot of animals um the first response is to move if there's unfavorable climate you move now we're dealing with man-made barriers you know we've taken habitats and we've made them so patchy so animals can't move anymore that's just one small example of how we've changed the landscape um, then there's electric fences which pangolins happen to be very vulnerable with okay. and because they walk on two legs they come across an electric fence um, around a game reserve and they, they walk on, wait, that, i'm sorry they walk on two legs <laughs> 
<laughs> they walk on two legs, just the two hind legs, not like totally up straight, like but a they're very hunched over. Not like a meerkat, very much the opposite of a meerkat. Oh so imagine a, an animal walking on all fours, except the front two are lifted. That so it's still very wild. low to the ground, but it's just walking on the two hind legs. Okay, I'm and including uses a video long... of a pangolin walking. Yes, yeah, you chat. must, you that must. I will give you one of those. Amazing. <laughs> I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea. I've only seen pictures of pangolin. I've never seen actual video footage. Yep, that yep. Is insane it's amazing that. every now and then they'll touch their front legs just to maintain balance but for the most part it's that giant tail and the front of the body counterbalance system it's just it's incredible that and it makes sense because so it keeps adorable. their nose close to the ground you know they can sit yeah, out yeah. things and they can so yeah and but unfortunately because of that when they come across an electric fence the trip wire at the bottom mm -hmm. um, and their defense mechanism is to curl into a ball when they're threatened so as right. soon as they get the initial shock, they curl into a ball around the fence and then they can be continuously electrocuted. So that's not great. Um, so that's another example of how humans have mm -hmm. kind of altered their landscape in a way. But you know, then you've got a million other things like overgrazing and agriculture and mm -hmm. oh, the list is endless. Yes. You know, in the way that we've changed the system and just minimized, or let me not use the word minimized, but made the available habitat to so many species so tiny. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's something we really need to focus on is preserving those habitats that are left right. for many species. Which is, um, you're back to Swalu and its location. That's why it's such a great success story. Former farmland mm -hmm. converted into this gorgeous game reserve with all of these incredible projects going on. So, I mean, you're, I, I think that's such a blessing to work there and to see that happening firsthand. Yeah. Is um, that particular, you're talking about um, you know, land use and we see that all throughout Africa with the human wildlife con uh, conflict. Is the, is the land where it's around Swalu, uh, is, is that ideal farmland or, or are there other places in South Africa, Southern Africa, that would be more, um, again, ideal uh, for a farmer to cultivate land? Um, it's, it's tricky as well. I think it, it would depend on your objective for like, what are you trying to save? Are you trying to save all the indigenous pieces that used to be there, mm -hmm. in which case you have to know the history of the land and you have to know how the system works before you can try and preserve it. Okay. Um, but I think in any part of the country, wherever you are, preserve the land that you can la um, preserve. And that part of the country, the Northern Cape province, has a lot of farms, um, mm -hmm. which is great in a way because it's big open land that we haven't shoved buildings on and we haven't right. you know, yeah. completely trashed. But then you've got... Um, the agriculture side of things, you know, the crop lands and stuff, which is in its own way, destroying land. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say it so harshly because I do appreciate our farmers and I appreciate of what course. they're doing and they have their role. Um, it's a delicate balance. But yeah, I think they, there's a sustainable way to do farming and and that needs to be taken seriously for sure. For sure. Um, now, before we, uh, assuming we still have the first part of this recording intact, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get close to um to kind of signing off here. Uh, I, I any just incredible moments with pangolins? Any stories with pangolins from uh you, from your side that you'd like to share? I mean, there, there's so many. My mind is just like flashbacking now <laughs> to the past few, like a film just going through okay, my mind. Okay, let me let me put it um, this way. What tell us about your first encounter with a pangolin and what the oh, emotions you experienced? Oh, now. that was just. So, well, so there's two. The, the first, first one, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to use the telemetry set. I didn't know what I was listening for. It was dark. I was like, where are we? What are we doing? That was crazy. And when I saw that penguin for the first time, my heart dropped and just started racing. And I was like shaking. Oh and let me God. tell you, Justin, that feeling has not stopped. That's Every time perfect. I find a pangolin, I'm like... <laughs> heart racing I'm like, oh, this is amazing this is incredible um so that was the first time the penguin was kind of shy just sat there didn't do much and we thought okay let's not bother it too much let's leave but the second time that i had gone back to see a penguin it was in winter so it was during the day mm -hmm. and that penguin was so comfortable with us being around i don't know why yeah, that was just his personality i followed him around for four years he was like the most incredible penguin <laughs> couldn't care less that I was around or anyone that was around. And so I really got to see what penguins do just through that, you know, and that, that particular sighting, he kind of, we were standing 
on a dune, but not on the crest. He was on the crest coming mm-hmm. towards us. So it was okay. like eye level for us. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And he was just coming towards us and feeding. And it was the first time I had realized that penguins wrap their tails around the tree to anchor themselves while oh. they're feeding. Because they're incredibly strong and ripping bark away and all kinds of things. And so it was just like, and it's so vivid in my mind. I'm just like. <laughs> I could <It> tell. Was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a special one. That was really incredible. And he was a really cool fo- penguin to follow the past four or five years it's just yeah then they all grew on me after that i i think that folks that haven't been on a, you know a, a proper wildlife trip before anywhere in the world it could be you know africa india antarctica when you get these first encounters with wildlife that you've only seen on tv it, it's mm-hmm. indescribable and it stays with you just seeing your reaction those emotions that memory that still it's the same you can just yeah. access it somehow exactly it's and, and it Click lasts your forever fingers and it's there exactly yeah. no it was really one to remember but the, the, there are so many <laughs> it's been a long and a short five years you know i think there's just so many memories i mean there was a time where i was, I was low on the ground trying to photograph a pangolin and you can't, like he just stopped for no reason. Mm-hmm. And okay, they, they don't exactly move their eyes around, but it was like he looked at me, turned his tra- tra- trajectory <laughs> towards me and just walked straight towards me until he was like right here, smelling my face. And I thought, <laughs> no, come now, this is too much. And I kind of get up, look around to celebrate with someone and there's nobody there. There's nobody yeah. there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this <laughs> happened. <laughs> this is amazing. So yeah, it is an indescribable thing. I mean, I'm, describing it now but it is one of those things you have to see it and i've never met anybody who sees a pangolin and is not instantly in love with it it's just one of those magical magical animals i wish i could relate to that unfortunately i can't but (laughs) still got a lot of life left to live and i I have a prediction i I know that you know for for you want these talks to stay up on youtube and spotify and apple music these chats to last you know, I want somebody to be able to listen to this three, four years from now and just still be right there. But during the time of recording, we're during, we're in COVID, right? Mm-hmm. I think that you are going to lose it when you see your first pangolin again back in the bush. Justin, you have no, my heart <laughs> just started racing as you said that. I'm like, I, I visualize it and I, just, I might just melt. I might just be, I'll be a puddle. I know. And, and you know, people have been sending me pictures and stuff, the guys who are still on the property and like, look what I found. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. I'll be back, guys. I'll be Don't back. Do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so mean. That's mean. <laughs> no, but it's good. It's nice. You know, they're still around and people are still able to track them. And just knowing that someone's kind of doing my job in my absence. For sure. <laughs> in a way. Sure. <laughs> it's good. Well, Wendy, I cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, this has been fascinating and fun. And for I'm going to include all the links and the socials to keep, uh, the donation Brilliant. link to the email address to Twalu, the Twalu Foundation. And I'm also going to include the link to for my contact page for Safari Planning in South Africa to include yeah. Twalu. We handle all of the logistics from A to Z. And again, uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been awesome. Thank you, Justin. This has been quite an experience. I love talking about pangolins and yes. sharing with the world Me whatever too. I can. For sure. Hopefully you'll be able to come and see a pangolin one day. I can't wait. I can't wait. And we are, we'll hang out for sure. For sure. All right. Take care, Wendy. Have a great afternoon. All right. Evening. Have a good one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Smart Aspirations. Justin Hoff is the manager of Swaggy Swan Travel. For all travel-related inquiries, please visit www.swaggyswan.com. That's www.swaggyswan.com. And click Inquiries. Have a stupendous day. And we'll see you next week.